I find that introducing the governor is about one of the most meaningless exercises that one could uh, take part in because everyone here knows him, everyone here knows his background, everyone here knows that he has been a rock star from, the, uh, from a young age, uh, went to Cambridge, captain Sri Lanka at rugby, played cricket, a uh, whole lot of other things, and then, uh, of course, went on to um, w join the Central Bank in the 1970s, um, and, and after that, the Commonwealth Secretariat, where he was the Director of Economic Affairs. Um, last June or July, uh, I, I think it was June that the announcement was made. Um, I don't really, how, how many of you are on LinkedIn? Okay, no one wants to admit it. but. Um, I don't really post too much on LinkedIn, but um, I felt it, I, I had to express myself. Uh, and this is what I posted. A brilliant choice and a huge wo vote for integrity. And what I was talking about was the appointment of the central bank governor, uh, Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami. And I think it's been uh, very clear that one of the most defining positive factors within our economy has, how, has been how the central bank has operated, we brought back independence of the central bank, and we brought back some uh, excellent policies in terms of um, how we're managing our interest rates, inflation targeting, and our currency. Uh, so uh, I, I won't go into much more detail uh, of um, the achievements of um, the governor. I would like to welcome you. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for the second time. You've been joining uh, Asia Securities events, and. Uh, we look forward to hearing your words. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Raminder, uh, for those very kind words. It's only been 18 months, so it, it's still too early to tell whether, whether this has been a good appointment or not. But uh, if I come back uh, next year and you still have the same opinion, well, then maybe we'll have better grounds for thinking that it may have been a, have been, been a reasonable choice. But um, speaking to Duminda, <clears throat> um, I thought... Uh, I would divide up my remarks into three. Uh, he was quite keen that I share with you uh, my take in, on the world economic situation, uh, because uh, the headwinds that were there in recent years perhaps have reduced and we may have a more propitious set of circumstances. So I'll try to expand on that, uh, on that a little bit to start with. <coughs> then of course, um, you know, in my position, when one has a captive audience of this type, uh, it's too tempting not to try to p give a, to pitch uh, for what the uh, government is trying to do in terms of its policies and programs. So I'll give you a thumbnail sketch um, of, of of those uh, matters. And finally, uh, my colleagues from Bank for Vision have shared with me what I think are some uh, useful insights on the theme for the day. And I'll finish off by sharing uh, those with you. On the global economy. Um, I think for the you know five successive quarters now, uh, we are seeing uh, global growth accelerating. Uh, that is as of the second quarter of 2017. And for the first time since the global financial crisis, we are having synchronized growth in the US, Europe, and Japan. Uh, and in fact, at the IMF World Bank annual meetings in Washington in October this year, there was a much more upbeat sentiment. Uh, after years of uh, uncertainty uh, and, and um, grappling uh, with, uh, with new and, and more complex threats, there was a sense that the world economy uh, was on the mend. Not only was global growth uh, accelerating, uh, but international trade, despite the concerns about protectionism in the US and Europe in particular, a global great growth is also uh, expected to expand by about 2% this year, uh, global trade that is. Now, despite this improvement, it's fair to also point out that the accelerated growth and the, the uptick in global trade still falls well short of what we saw in what is termed as the nice decade the decade between the Asian financial crisis and the global uh, financial crisis was known as the nice decade, that is non-inflationary continuous expansion. That's what we had from the late 80s 
to two, late um, uh, 90s to um, 2008. So we have not got anywhere near that, but all the same, we're beginning to see uh, an improvement in the global economy. Despite this improvement, there also exists some key risks. One is the specter of rising protectionism in the US in particular and Europe. Secondly, the developments in the, in the, the, on the monetary side in the major economies are not as synchronized as they have been in recent years. Because for a number of years after the global financial crisis, the Federal Reserve, the BOJ, the ECB, the Bank of England, and all the major central banks were pretty much in a robustly expansionary, uh, um, unorthodox monetary policy phase. Now we are seeing a delinking of the monetary policy in the sense that the major economies are at a different point in the cycle of their interest rate formulation. The U.S. is ahead of the game. We've already seen some normalization of the uh, of the uh, of, of U.S. interest rates, and they are in a tightening mode, albeit very slowly. Uh, and I think the uh, appointment of Jerome Powell uh, as a new Fed governor is likely to mean continuity, because I think he's pretty much in the same space that Janet Yellen was in terms of his uh, perspective uh, on, on monetary policy uh, in the period ahead. So, but the US is in a tightening phase, and the European, the Central Bank, has just begun to, um, to wind down its asset purchase program. But the Bank of Japan is expected to continue with its unorthodox monetary policies for some time more, because they are struggling to meet their inflation target of 2%. So what is the implication of that? The implication is that we're likely to see greater volatility in asset and currency markets. Um, so that is a, a set of risks uh, that are out there because of this non-synchronization of monetary policy uh, amongst the major central banks of the world. Then again, in relation to normalization, another risk in relation to normalization of monetary policy uh, in the US and Europe is the possibility of unintended consequences. Because this is totally uncharted territory. The unorthodox monetary policies that we saw since the um, onset of the global financial crisis was different from anything we have seen in economic history before. And therefore, this unwinding again is going to be, as I said, in uncharted territory. So the implications um, are, are, are something we cannot foresee entirely. Uh, but the central banks themselves are confident that if they can signal their intentions well in advance, that there are, as long as there are no surprises for the markets, uh, that they could manage this normalization in a way that does not generate instability uh, in, in asset and currency markets. Another risk, um, you know, we've seen uh, OPEC perhaps uh, cooperate better than they have done for some time in terms of the production cuts on the oil front. Uh, and there's also cooperation between OPEC and Russia, which has seen oil prices firm up to about $60 per barrel. But here again, I, I don't think Saudi Arabia is any longer the swing producer. The swing producers are the U.S. shale producers. And given that, and given the, um, the general prognosis that once the price hits $60 per barrel, that the shale production can be ramped up quite significantly. And the thing about shale production is that the lead time is much shorter. So you can get oil onto the market much quicker than you could do in the past. So if you take all that together, uh, the prospects are that uh, $60 is likely to be towards the upper end of the price range for oil. Uh, but of course, if there is a, a spike in oil prices uh, as a result of better uh, cartelization on the part of OPEC and Russia, uh, in the past, higher oil prices has led to global recessions. Another risk 
is the impact of, incre impact of the increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. Now this is a total imponderable uh, over which nobody has any control, but it's clear that these extreme events are becoming more frequent and uh, more intense and therefore more expensive uh, and clearly they will pose a risk going forward. And the final risk I'd like to draw your attention to are the geopolitical risks, uh, particularly in relation to Iran and North Korea. Uh, here again, uh, I personally don't think it, it'll spill over, uh, but uh, some policy making in some important countries is more erratic than we would like it to be. So it's, uh, uh, that clearly has to be factored in as a risk. So let me quickly run through some of the key economies and my uh, take on those, and very, very briefly. Uh, the advanced economies as a whole are projected to grow by 2.2% in 2017 and 2% 2 in 2018, supported by cyclical rec recovery in manufacturing and trade, as well as an upturn in financial markets. And the threat of uh, deflation has probably uh, faded away. Uh, even in Japan, while they're having difficulty in hitting the 2% target, I don't think anybody now thinks they're going to regress back to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deflation. The US economy, which is of course our largest export market, is expected to grow by 2.2% in 2017 and 2.3% 2 in 2018, and unemployment is also at historically low levels. So clearly um, um, the, the interest rate tightening is likely to take place, but as I said, it's likely to be slow, and the peak of the current interest rate cycle is likely to be lower than uh, historical peaks. But one thing one would want is for the US not to retreat into isolationism. Despite the reduction of the weight of the US economy in the global, global economy, um, US is still a massive economy, it can, and its policies continue to have a, a major impact on the rest of the world. So an outward-looking and engaged U.S. can be a major force for good. For this, protectionism and isolationism should be resisted in the interests of both the U.S. and the rest of the world. Um, going on to, to Europe, the Eurozone, uh, you know, after a number of years of very sluggish growth, one is beginning to see more broad-based growth within the Eurozone. Even the southern economies are now beginning to see uh, uh, more resilient growth, uh, and growth is more widely shared across the Eurozone. Um, one, one risk or one threat is the fact that banking reform in Europe has not progressed anything like as far as it has done in the US. Um, that is a risk, but as far as growth keeps picking up, uh, the chances are that those risks can be managed. And here again, the ECB is, as I said, commenced its normalization process. It's winding down its asset purchase program. This is uncharted territory, um, but uh, I think the central bankers are fairly confident that they can uh, manage the normalization without too much disruption. For the UK, which is our second largest export market on, on a country basis, um, clearly Brexit. Uh, how Brexit turns out is going to be a major determinant of the prospects for the UK economy. A hard Brexit will have serious consequences for the British economy in terms of loss of output, incomes and employment. New investment will be deterred and some existing deter investors are likely to shift uh, their operations out of Britain. The net effect is likely to depend on A, the the deal that the UK works out in terms of its exit, and then the uh, negotiations it has with non-European countries uh, in terms of market access. Uh, clearly, um, there's been talk of negotiation with the US, but I don't think the US is really ready for trade deals at the moment. Uh, but there's talk again of trying to revive some of the old Commonwealth links, links with countries like uh, India, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Singapore, etc. So there are some uh, large economies, uh, but that, that's again still at a very incipient stage. Uh, and of course, we ourselves um, 
have the opportunity to work out some kind of trading arrangement with, with the US. Um, and probably the biggest threat is to the city of London. Uh, if you have a hard Brexit, um, then uh, the London is likely to lose out to Frankfurt, particularly in Paris, as a financial center within Europe. What about emerging markets and developing countries? The IMF's growth projection for emerging markets and developing countries is 4.6% growth for 2017 and 49 for 2018. And Asia remains the fastest growing region. For a short while, South Asia was the fastest growing region uh, in Asia when the Indian economy was growing at over 7%. But with the current slowdown in the Indian economy, the uh, East and Southeast Asians have overtaken South Asia. But still, um, there is resilient growth within the Asian region as a whole, which remains the fastest growing region. And interestingly, China alone contributed 39% to global growth, the delta. 39% of the delta in terms of growth came from China, despite its slowdown uh, to 6.5%. And if you take China and India together, they accounted for over 60% of global growth. So that's where the, the impetus for growth is coming in the world economy. Now, if you take China particularly, the new normal seems to be 6 to 6.5% of growth. But you know, one needs to take account of the fact that it's now 6 to 6.5% of 11.9 trillion economy. Now, 10 years ago, you may have had, or even five years ago, you may have had 10% growth of a much smaller economy. So in terms of the impact on the rest of the world, in terms of the demand uh, and supply of goods and services, there probably isn't very much of a difference. 6.5% of a growth in an 11.9 trillion economy probably has as much an impact or maybe a more greater impact than 10% in what was a smaller economy. So China's impact on the rest of the world is not likely to wane uh, significantly, despite some slowdown in their growth. Now, people have concerns about the, uh, the credit growth in China, about the quality of credit, uh, credit and the volume of growth. But you know that Chinese have been remarkably good at managing their economy. Time and again, year after year, you hear analysts say, oh, there are all these risks about the Chinese economy. But time after time, they've been able to manage it. Uh, and I'm confident that they will uh, manage 6 to 6.5% 6 of growth uh, in the Chinese economy. And the structural changes of moving from external to internal demand, from uh, investment to consumption, those are also uh, progressing steadily. In some areas, perhaps not as quickly as the Chinese themselves would like, but it is certainly moving in the right direction. India, growth has slowed over the last four or five uh, quarters, primarily due, due to two short-term effects, as you probably all know. One is demonetization, and two are the initial glitches um, associated with the introduction of the the um, uh, goods and services tax, the GST. Now, the GST, while it has led to some short-term disruption, uh, in the medium term, in my view, has to be a good thing. I think the Indian slogan is one tax, uh, uh, sorry, one nation, one tax, one market. So for the first time, you're going to have a single market uh, in India. Um, prior to the glitches associated with the introduction of the GST, uh, analysts were saying that there could be 1.5 to 2 percent boost to the Indian growth rate from the GST and the creation of a single market. And I think it may not be as high as that, but certainly the Indian economy, I think, will recover and will probably record over 7 percent growth uh, uh, in the medium term. We're seeing a firming up of commodity prices. In, invariably, as the global economy picks up steam, uh, the demand side pressures are such that commodity prices will increase. And we've seen that in oil prices, but we've seen that in other commodity prices as well. Um, so that's something, again, to keep in mind. What are the implications for Sri Lanka? The different channels through which uh, developments in the global economy come through are transmitted uh, to the, to the uh, Sri Lankan economy. First is trade. As far as trade is concerned, our major expo uh, export markets, the, the uh, Europe and the US are doing better. Uh, so that, from being a headwind, should now become a tailwind. 
And if you put that side by side with the restoration of GSP plus and the lifting of the fishing ban, clearly means that we have a more propitious set of circumstances as far as our key export markets are concerned. And the expected acceleration of growth in India will also be a positive for Sri Lankan exports. India is, is our third largest market. Um, because, you see, in the past, we've had proximity to India. But that proximity has been next to <laughs> worthless, simply because infrastructure in both countries have been so bad. You know, the roads, the ports, the airports were so bad in both countries that they increased transaction costs so much that even if you're 20 miles away, it was not of much use. But now, you're seeing infrastructure improving in both countries. And going forward, this proximity will have a much higher premium for us to take advantage of. And so Indian growth can play to our advantage. And if we take advantage of the improving infrastructure and the reduction in transaction costs because of infrastructure improvement, because of the GST uh, introduction, I think we'll have more opportunities as far as the Indian market is concerned, with or without ETCA. Uh, if ETCA comes in, in my view, that will increase opportunity. But even without ETCA, I think there are a set of circumstances which are emerging, which should allow us to have more opportunities in the Indian market. On the import side, clearly there is transmission on the import side as well. Oil prices are firmer. Uh, clearly that has an impact on our balance of payments. And if that is coupled with drought, as we've experienced this year, it does have a serious impact uh, on our balance of payments. But if we have, uh, if we have normal levels of hydro generation, uh, a 60%, $60 a barrel is something we can cope with. Uh, as far as the other commodities are concerned, uh, you know, we are, in, the, the imports, our key imports are like flour, sugar, milk food, etc. They are more linked to agricultural production levels uh, rather than the business cycle. Unlike kind of industrial raw materials like uh, steel, um, uh, copper, etc., which are linked to the business cycle and where price, as gro global growth picks up, prices go up. Um, agricultural price, uh, product prices tend to be uh, part of a different uh, set of dynamics. Uh, so that will depend on global production and, of course, weather conditions play into that. On capital flows, here the big narrative, uh, in my view, is the fact that China, as you all know, like Japan, is now, as you know, Japan in the 80s sw switched from a laser like focus on exporting goods to exporting, to a greater focus on exporting capital. And the Chinese are in the process of doing the same thing. So the One Belt, One Road initiative um, is, is that it's really, in my view, a, a similar uh, process to what the Japanese did in the 80s in terms of recycling their surplus. But the Chinese one is far, far more ambitious, far, far greater in magnitude. I mean, I think it's supposed to be something like 10 times bigger than the Marshall Plan was after the uh, Second World War. So there's a massive amount, a wall of capital which the Chinese are going to push out through these two arteries. I think it covers something like 60 countries. We are fortunate in that we are slap bang in the center of the maritime Silk Road, which opens up significant opportunities for us in terms of attracting capital from China. Uh, as far as institutional investment flows are concerned, um, of course, um, you know, um, the buoyancy of uh, stock markets in advanced countries and, and the increase of yields more generally in the advanced economies as those economies recover may mean that the, the, the volume of money which has come into uh, emerging markets from institutional uh, investors uh, may get tempered. So that makes it even more important for individual countries to make sure that their economic management and macroeconomic fundamentals are strong so that you can get, uh, you can make sure that your share of the uh, institutional investor flow uh, is not uh, affected too much. On long-term debt, the cost of raising sovereign bonds will come under upward pressure as the normalization takes place of uh, monetary policy in the major economies. So here, because we were, a, we are still a twin deficit economy, we have a fairly high premium above the risk-free, that's the U.S. Treasury, 10-year uh, U.S. Treasury rate uh, for our cost of borrowing. It's been pretty high. 
Now, what we need to do is to make sure that we strengthen our macro fundamental to the point where we drive down that premium. If we are able to drive down that premium by more than the increase in the risk-free rate, the US rates, then clearly our cost of borrowing will be remain neutral or come down. So that really is what we need to do. We need to focus on getting our macro policies even better so that we drive this premium down and thereby negate the impact of the anticipated increase in uh, the risk-free rate, the US Treasury rates. Remittances ha have, been for the f have been coming down in recent months, and uh, higher oil prices uh, clearly will, will be uh, helpful in that respect. On tourism, recovery in Europe uh, can boost uh, 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 arrivals and earnings from that quarter, but of course the UK is an important market, and if the Brexit uh, pans out badly, that could have a negative impact on, on tourists from, from the UK. So, in conclusion, the world economy seems to be in better shape, uh, and those, uh, the advanced economies, which are our key markets, are doing better. Uh, so on balance, I think, uh, we have a better set of external circumstances, which will give us tailwinds. And we need to focus on how we mitigate the negative impacts uh, that can come through, uh, the, particularly through the increase in uh, international interest rates. Let me quickly now give you a, a, a pitch as far as what the government is doing in terms of uh, its policies and programs. Um, in terms of the state of the economy, maybe in the Q&A we can go into the, to that. I'll focus on the policies. Um, the first thing the government is very keen on doing is to strengthen macroeconomic policy uh, making. And here there are four frameworks that are being put in place. Not only are these frameworks being put in place, but an effort is being made to institutionalize them so that they are more resilient and are not as subject to the political cycle uh, as they have been in the past. So what are those frameworks? You've seen the fiscal consolidation uh, framework. It's embedded in the IMF EFF program. All of you know it, so I'm not going to go into that. Basically, the deficit is intended to come down to 3.5% of GDP, and the big effort is on the revenue side. Now, how is the government trying to institutionalize that? It is looking at the Fiscal Responsibility Management Act, which has been in place since about 2003, I think. However, it has had no teeth. The idea is to give that act some teeth by setting out clear, specific reasons for when you can deviate from the targets. The current targets, I think, are 3% of GDP for the budget and 60% of GDP for public debt. So you have to set out, if you deviate, you, you, you would, if, if this goes through, you would have to set out clear reasons as to why, you, you would set out in advance specific reasons as to why this target, these targets can be uh, uh, breached. It could be a natural disaster, it could be a severe re recession because of a, a severe exogenous shock, but you set out the reasons when, why you can deviate. And also, if you do deviate, you have to set out a clear plan as to how you would come back. Now, this is something we are pressing for very hard from the central bank. It will be very good if everybody involved in, in uh, economic policy uh, can give some tailwind uh, to this proposal. Uh, some of the senior politicians are interested in doing this, and I think we need to get this done. It's important that we have, uh, have this uh, 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 Fiscal Responsibility uh, Management Act given teeth. Uh, because the budget, as you know, has been the main source of instability uh, in the system. So we need to put as much sand in the wheels as possible uh, to prevent people from deviating from the framework that has been set out for fiscal consolidation. Secondly, on monetary policy, again, as you all know, the central bank is introducing a flexible inflation targeting regime, um, and you know that should enable us to be much more proactive and forward forward-looking, and we intend to be very much data-driven in the way we set monetary policy. Again, I can talk during the, the um, q and I'm happy to talk about our thinking as to where monetary policy is at the moment in a context of high in headline inflation and relatively low core inflation. Um, so, uh, but this framework will give us, I hope, a much more forward-looking 
uh, monetary policy, which actually uh, tolerates much less fiscal forbearance than in the past. Uh, and there will be, as I said, accountability and legal frameworks. I think in the extreme cases, the central bank governor has to resign if you don't meet the target. I, I think that's not a bad, bad framework to have. Uh, uh, the, 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 on, on the exchange rate, um, we are currently not intervening in the market other than to purchase dollars uh, to build up non-debt non creating, uh, non creating uh, uh, reserves and to prevent the rupee from appreciating. Um, but uh, there are certain parameters, there are certain well-established parameters used by other countries for managing the exchange rate in a market-oriented framework, which still leave the capacity to intervene if there is speculative volatility. So that, again, will be a framework for the, for the exchange rate. And the final framework I'd like to talk in terms of macroeconomic policy making relates to liability management. You know we're an outlier as far as our debt metrics are concerned. That really is the Achilles heel in the economy. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, uh, the underlying problem stems from the fact that uh, we allowed exports to come down from a peak of 33% of GDP in 2000 down to 12.7% in 2016. At the same time, we allowed foreign commercial borrowing to go up from 3% of GDP in 2007 to 13% in 2016. I mean, that is a pretty suicidal set of policies. If you allow your exports to collapse and at the same time go on a foreign commercial borrowing binge, which is what we did. That, that is the big hole we are in at the moment. And that's what we are trying to manage. So how are, we, how are we trying to do that? Clearly one thing is you've got to have export growth. I will talk a little bit more about exports, but that's crucial. It's crucial not only for growth and for employment generation, but it's crucial for us to get out of the big hole that we are in terms of our debt servicing. And it is also uh, uh, um, uh, necessary to have fiscal consolidation. If our fiscal consolidation trajectory goes out of kilter, then we're not going to be able to manage our debts. Now, what is the framework that's being put in place to manage, manage the debt? Provided fiscal consolidation uh, stays on track, one is there, is a, there is a peak in domestic debt repayments in 2018. Fortuitously for us, the last five months of this year, there were no debt maturities. So we've used that space to raise money. Though there were no maturities, we raised 20, 25 billion each month since, since I think it was August. So we will have a kind of a war chest of 100, 110 billion, a buffer to use to manage this peak next year. There are seven large um, issuance days next year. So even between those, there will be four or five months where we can again raise money for, for as, uh, to boost our buffer to manage the peak. So that is how we're going to try to manage this peak next year. And we're reasonably confident that we can do it, provided the fiscal consolidation stays on track and elections and other distractions don't throw us uh, off our, our um, focus. The, the, the other part, on the external debt side, Again, as you know, there's a bunching from 2019 onwards. Again, fortuitously, though we have something like 600 million US dollars worth of interest payments next year, there is no sovereign bond maturity. So that gives us a bit of space to try to, again, build up a war chest to manage the bunching. How are we going to do that? First thing is, at the moment, the Expropriation Act does not enable uh, the government to raise any money more than what is required for that particular year's deficit. So you can't raise extra money for liability management. You can only raise money to finance the deficit. So because of that, the new liability management bill will be presented to Parliament, I hope, this month, at some point this month, and passed next month, which will enable that, that borrowing cap the borrowing limit to be exceeded for specific purposes, like liability management. Again, there will be another cap, so it's not a kind of opening the door out completely, but to create some space to borrow some extra money which can be used for liability management. So that will be used to 
raise some additional resources in 2018 to help us to do some switching, buybacks, etc., for the money due from 2019 onwards. On top of that, and this is something that is very helpful, the government has taken a decision to use the proceeds of all divestitures of public assets for liability management, for debt repayment. So the $1.1 billion which is going to come in starting from the 9th of December on the Hamantota port lease will go into a special account for liability management, as will the money for all other uh, uh, divestitures. The foreign proceeds into one account, rupee proceeds into another for uh, liability management for foreign and uh, rupee debt. So this is the framework that we are creating to manage this very challenging uh, 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 debt servicing um, profile that's ahead of the country. But while it is challenging, we do think we can manage it, provided, of course, we don't make the situation worse by letting go in terms of fiscal discipline. So those are the frameworks. Quickly, um, the growth model uh, the government is working on embedded in the in the um, in the uh, Vision 2025 document is, of course, it's private sector driven, not for any ideological reason, simply because the government does not have the fiscal space because of the debt and deficit dynamics to drive the development process. So it has to be private sector. And of course, exports and FDI as key pillars. The 21 million market, purchasing power of 3,800 USD. You can't drive sustained 7%, 8% growth uh, through selling just in the domestic market. You have to export, and you need exports to pay back your debt. Plus FDI, as far as I know, countries as large as China or small as uh, Singapore have not had serious e export transformation. Other than Japan and, and Korea at a different age, uh, in, in, in the last 30, 40 years, export transformation has had FDI as a key part of the story. So though that's what we need to do. And the government is having a strategy to improve the investment climate. They've got these task forces looking at eight pillars of the World Bank's doing business index as how to drive it forward. Um, it has got a more focused investment promotion strategy. They're working with the Center for International Development in Harvard and Professor Ricardo Hausman to identify subsectors where we would have a comparative advantage. And then within those subsectors, anchor investors who could make a difference. In, in, in uh, Vietnam, Samsung accounted for 40% of their exports at one point. In Costa Rica, Intel, 75% of their exports. So if you can get a few anchor investors, they can have a transformative impact on, their, on, your, on our export performance. So there's going to be a much more focused attempt in terms of investment promotion. And as far as trade facilitation is concerned, I saw in the newspaper today, the National Trade Facilitation Committee uh, is confident that by the middle of next year there will be a trade portal and a electronic single window in the custom operating. Um, so th those will reduce the, the, the transaction costs of cross-border movement of goods. Um, now, the potentially the jewel in the crown is trade policy. If we are successful in negotiating a deepening and widening of the agreement with India, and a similar agreement with China, uh, Singapore, and we invigorate our agreement with Pakistan, and we have GSP plus with Europe, we would be the only country that has preferential access to the markets of China, India, and Europe. There is no other country in the world that has that. Singapore has access, preferential access to China, China and India. But no other country has preferential access to China, India, and Europe. So what is the advantage of that? Clearly, it creates opportunities for our exporters. But much more than that, it differentiates us from the 190-odd countries which are chasing FDI. That is a key differentiator for us to be able to show this preferential access to this market of over 3 billion people to attract investment in here to come and say, locate in Sri Lanka, sell on a preferential basis basis to, 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 to India from 20 miles away, sell on a preferential basis to China, where there is going to be a strong infrastructure link developed by the Chinese themselves, and use the 
the, the channel to Europe that we have developed over the years. So, you know, this is a potential game changer if we're able to take advantage of it. We have to, uh, my friend Subhashini Abe Singh always says, this is all very well, but what are we going to sell? So clearly we have to have the supplies. And FDI, domestic investment has to play a role. And FDI has to play a role. And we, in, as in the policymaking branch, have to play a role. Competitive exchange rate. Get para tariffs out, because the most dynamic component of the international trading system is the uh, production sharing networks and exports and imports that take place within these in uh, cross-border production sharing networks. Now, we have only 7% of our exports going out through these production sharing networks. Over 50% of global trade goes out as part of production sharing networks. India, which is generally seen still as a much more closed economy than ours, has 22% of its trade going out. So we have been excluded from these regional and global supply chains. In my view, largely because we have para tariffs. Because in, 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 this, in this supply chain narrative, the, the distinction between exports and imports gets blurred. You have to bring stuff in, do your little bit in the process, and send it out. Uh, and by having all these para tariffs, by allowing effective protection to double, as we did over a 10-year period, we have basically cut ourselves out from the most dynamic part of the international trading system. So the government is now committed to reducing para tariffs. Over three years, they said they're going to take most of them off. Uh, that will create better conditions uh, to plug into these international supply chains. So that's on the trade policy side. And let me just finish by saying, you know, there are these major development projects, which you, all of you know about, the Western Regis Megapolis Plan, the, the Port City, um, then uh, the Japanese are doing a master plan for candy. There is uh, developments around Kurunaga, the Kulia Piti, Bingiria, uh, special economic zone. Then down the southern coast, you have uh, in Kalutara, is it Millennia? I hope I'm getting the term right. Millennia export processing zone. Then some tourism development in Ledua, down south, and other places. Then, of course, Hamantota. And the uh, Japanese and the Indians, sorry, the Singaporeans and the Japanese are doing a master plan for Chinkamali. And there, basically, the idea is that uh, Japanese, Singaporeans, and Indians would work together to develop that. Last word about China. I felt we've had that the discourse on the long-term lease of the port, in my view, has been set completely wrong in terms of the parameters within which it took place. That is much more than a port deal, what hopefully will happen in the Hamantota region. Because that port deal, of course, we need we needed to negotiate the best possible deal. But that what that deal triggers in the first phase are five investments in an LNG plant, a refinery, a steel plant, a ship repair facility, and a cement factory. The Chinese call those foundational industries. So they will set up those factories. The idea is to use the output of those, those factories to build the, their industrial zones in that area. So, you know, 69 years after independence, almost 70 now, uh, the very little has happened for the people of Monragala and over. The people of Hambantota have assets which don't work. And this port deal allows us to transform all that. It triggers, it catalyzes investment in that lagging region, which after all has been the heartland of two insurrections in the south of this country. So this gives us a chance to make up for what we haven't done over the last 69 years for the people of, of that area. Now, of course, there's labor, there's skills, all kinds of issues which need to be looked at. And all that has to be looked at in the whole. And the government is trying to do that. And, and let me finish by saying the plans are good. I think the plans are good. Of course, I need to say that. <laughs> I've been part of the story. But the challenge is to implement. The challenge is to implement. That is where the real test will be. If we implement, uh, this country can be a different place in five years. Thank you all very much.